Hello, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for being here with us today. I'm just going to wait a few more seconds to get started as we still have uh, a few people coming in. Um, so a few quick words before we get started. Um, today's session is all about creating more value for clients with personalized decumulation strategies. My name is Alex Mercer and I'll be your host today. I'm joined by my colleague Steve Arnott, SNAP's Financial Planning Project Lead, who will provide today's demonstration and run the Q&A. We are pleased to provide you with an educational session today that will not only allow us to explore research and practice, but also provide you with a CE credit. Before we get started, I'd like to do a quick tech check to make sure you can all hear me and see my screen. Can you send me a quick yes or even a smiley face through your question tab? You should see it in your control panel. Just click the arrow beside the word question and a window will pop up where you can type and hit send. Oh, wonderful. Uh, Joanne, Brenda, Davis, Adele, Ethel, Jeff, Ronnie, so glad to know you can all hear me and see my screen. So any questions you have throughout the session, uh, that's exactly how you will send them in. If your question isn't answered live, uh, just due to time constraints, we will follow up with you via email after the session. So Steve and I have our cameras turned on just to say hello. We will now shut them off to give you a full screen view of our presentation. So I'd like to start with introducing you to today's case study client, 64-year-old Sonia Hayes. Sonia is 64, but she's turning 65 in the new year. As she approaches her final year as working as an HR manager, she's beginning to prepare for the transition of working and investing to retiring and drawing on her savings. Recognizing the experience and expertise of this group, we will be focusing the presentation and analysis at a deeper level than what we would normally attempt to pack into a one hour session. We want to ensure you're taking as much away from this presentation as possible. For those of you who aren't already familiar with us here at Snap Projections, SNAP is a Canadian financial planning software platform. We help great financial advisors grow their practices and receive more referrals through efficient financial planning. Our mission is to help Canadians make better financial decisions so they have peace of mind while they work and a better quality of life when they retire. We execute this mission through working with great financial advisors like yourselves who embrace financial planning because we believe this is the best way to provide sound financial advice to Canadian consumers. If you're wondering what other advisors have to say after using SNAP projections or how we compare to other solutions, you don't need to look any further than the reviews page on our website. There are thousands of Canadian advisors already using SNAP projections to provide personalized financial planning for their clients. What you are going to see today is how you can model unique client circumstances, which will demonstrate the personalized advantages and disadvantages of different decumulation strategies during retirement. Now, you may be wondering how it could be possible to efficiently model and discuss what can be very complex financial situations at SNAP. We believe there are four components of planning software that are absolute essentials in order to achieve this. First comes transparency. When you need to explain something to your clients, you need to first be able to understand it yourself. I talk with advisors all the time who tell me that if they cannot see how the numbers are being calculated, they feel uncomfortable presenting the plan to their clients. It doesn't mean they need to run every calculation, but they need to be able to understand how the numbers were generated so they can conduct an audit if they need to. Some providers almost seem to hide the calculations, so advisors have no way of verifying the numbers. There's just no transparency. Next, comes flexibility, customization, and control. As the advisor, 
you need to have a very high level of flexibility and control over the plan if you want to model your clients lives accurately and make the plans personal for example you should not have to lump multiple tfsas together because your software isn't flexible enough to allow for multiple account types those types of restrictions can seem insignificant at first, but are often found in practice to make data entry cumbersome and create confusion for clients. Next comes ease of use. Lack of ease of use is one of the biggest barriers to software adoption. If it's hard to learn or hard to use, no one wants it. It's really that simple. Last, but certainly not least, comes customer support and service. Here at SNAP, we provide industry-leading customer support because we know it is a crucial component to your success. We're here to support you every step of the way. So what you're about to see here when I hand this over to Steve is that Snap will show you where the numbers are coming from. You'll see how much flexibility and control you have within the software and how straightforward learning to use the program will be. So, before we dig into the case study, let's discuss the research that has fueled today's topic. I'll start with Doug Chandler's research paper. And just a reminder that both papers we're referencing today are available for download in your handouts tab, and they will also be provided to you via email as well after the session. So for this particular research project, Doug was essentially addressing the question, are there rules of thumb for best practices when it comes to drawdown in retirement? He approached this research with two primary planning objectives, how to maximize the value of the estate for beneficiaries and how to minimize the risk of financial distress during the individual's lifetime. The overarching conclusion, it depends. Doug determined that when evaluating RIF strategies for a client, financial planners must take into account various factors such as the client's potential lifespan and future investment returns. He went on to say that it's important to note that relying on projections based on a single age and set of returns can create undue risk. Financial planners must consider a retiree's unique circumstances and create a personalized strategy accordingly. In FP Canada's press, relief, press release, Doug is quoted saying, when helping a client determine when and how to withdraw from a RIF, there are complexities involved and many unknowns. This research demonstrates the importance of seeing the bigger picture. That means accounting for things like current and future tax rates, income splitting opportunities, investment risks and returns, and more. Our very own Steve Arnott was invited to review this research and participate in an interview alongside Doug. The interview was conducted by Sean Brayman, chair of the Canadian Foundation for Financial Planning's Research Committee, where it was discussed how SNAP can be used to model the specific factors that Doug determined must be considered. While we don't have time to review this video today, we've put together a comprehensive article that includes the interview. I will send out the link to access that after the session today along with the other applicable resources. So that takes us next to Bonnie Jean McDonald's research paper, Get the Most from the Canada and Quebec Pension Plans by Delaying Benefits. Throughout this paper, she builds the argument that for the majority of Canadians, they are better off to defer CPP and OAS if they can afford to bridge the gap with other investments. She goes on to say that retirement financial planning practices are currently encouraging Canadians, whether directly or indirectly, to take their CPP and QPP benefits early. She says that the financial services industry needs to fundamentally rethink its approach to advising Canadians who are nearing retirement. But how? 
how can we start having better discussions around these topics when once again, the answer is going to be, it depends. As you're about to see, Steve is going to use SNAP to show you how you can model the trade-offs and what needs to be considered to ensure any advice given is truly personalized for the client. So let's bring this back to our case study. Before we give any advice, we need to take yet another step back. If we want to truly help determine the optimal drawdown strategy or uncover when it would be best to start taking government benefits, we need to first understand what the client's goals are. Does Sonia want to maximize her final estate value or is having adequate cash to spend her top priority? Today, taking into account Sonia's goals and priorities, we can look at comparing different strategies to best help her achieve that priority while still considering all of her unique financial and life circumstances. Steve will be modeling all four key considerations today to help Sonia determine when she should take her benefits, how to best draw down her assets, what opportunities she may have to access her home equity, and also determine what her maximum spending potential could be. So I'm going to hand it over to Steve now, and he will log in to Snap Projections. He will start with showing you a basic profile setup. As an existing client, we would typically already have this set up for Sonia, but I want you to be able to see the entire process from start to finish. You're about to see how simple, transparent, and flexible creating financial plans can be. To run a simple projection and answer some basic questions, we just need to enter a few data points. Name, date of birth, province of residence, income, current asset holdings, and any planned contributions. That's it. You'll see that with SNAP, we can be quick and simple, or we can conduct comprehensive financial planning. So I'll get Steve to take over now and log into SNAP. Terrific, thanks so much, Alex, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Snap Projections is a web-based platform, which means you can access your account from any Chrome browser on any computer without the need for a download. You'll go to snapprojections.com, and then in the top right, you can click Login in order to enter your username and password. You'll also have the option to enable a multi-factor authentication for added security. I'll click Login, and because I've entered all of that during today's session, I'll go directly into the client's page. This is where I can access all of the previous plans that I've created for clients. I can edit values if the client has provided updated information. I can copy a plan to run an alternate scenario, or I can go into the client report and generate a PDF file. Today, we're going to be starting from scratch. As Alex mentioned, typically we would have a plan for Sonia already in this list, but to show you the full set of data input process, we're going to start fresh and enter in a new plan for Sonia. So I'll start by entering in her personal information. She was born 1959 and currently lives in Alberta. In the top left corner, you'll see that there are three key sections to the SNAP software. There's the scenario setup flow that we're currently proceeding through. This is where we enter in our client details, general plan settings, expenses, incomes, assets, and so forth. Once we're done entering in the base client detail, we can proceed to the planning pages where all of that information comes together to show us our client's life on one page. From that page, we can edit values on an annual basis or for any specific period of the projection. And then when we're done and comfortable with all of the numbers, we can proceed to the client report in order to select which charts, tables, and commentary we'd like to include in a final client-facing document. For now, we'll continue through the scenario setup process. I'll click next at the bottom, and we'll go to the general plan settings page. We're going to start the plan as of 2023 with a target retirement age of 65 and a projection length of age 100. At the top, you'll see that you can import the most current FP Canada guideline assumptions for inflation and rate of return assumptions. As I scroll down, we have those values now populated here for inflation and here for rates of return. 
All of these values are gross rate of return values, so we want to adjust them for any expected management fees or advisory fees associated with the client's investments. So we'll go with one, two, and 5% for this projection. I'll click next to go to the expenses page. One very important aspect with SNAP is that you don't need every client detail in order to create a very valuable base projection for their circumstances. If you have information about how much they're currently spending, you can input that into the projection to have a, a head start in the process. But there are other ways that you can gather this information or provide projections without needing to go too granular with your client's information. In this case, we have gathered Sonia's base lifestyle spending need, which are related to things like groceries, transportation. These are recurring lifestyle needs that are expected to continue into retirement. This value for Sonia is $66,000 a year. So we'll enter that here and SNAP is automatically going to index that value over time for inflation. And we'll be able to see and edit this value on the planning page once we proceed to the next phase of the plan. We can also add additional expenses for any itemized line items that you'd like to add to the plan. Things like additional travel. So in this case, she's looking for extra travel of $10,000 we're going to index that expense for the general rate of inflation in our plan, which is currently 2.1%. And we're going to start that in the year of retirement and run it for the first decade until she turns 74. We can highlight that in our client reports so that we can have a conversation with Sonia about that goal being fully funded. If we wanted, we could add other expenses. Common examples are car purchases every seven years or major gifts to kids to help them with a home purchase or some other mile milestone um, and we can add those and then select whether we want to include that in our charting for client conversation purposes. I'll click next and go to the incomes page. Currently Sonia is earning $125,000. Once again we have the option to index that at any specific percentage or we can clear the value in the cell in order to link it once again to the general inflation rate. We're inputting this as employment income, so SNAP is automatically going to deduct CPP and EI values. It will tax it appropriately for the province. It will track and earn additional RSP room. It's going to start as of the first year of the plan and then continue until the end of the year before she retires. If we wanted, we could add additional incomes, things like rental income or other sources that she might have in the future. And we can also add defined benefit pension plans, which we'll do in this case. She's planning to retire at 65 and that's when her benefit will start. You'll see that we have the option to input a pre-age 65 value if the client has a bridge benefit or is starting their pension prior to age 65. In this case, we can set these values to zero as they won't apply to the plan. And then for age 65 and onwards, she's expecting 30,000 a year with a 1% indexing rate. I'll click next and go to the assets page. SNAP adds a non-registered account to the projection as a default in case the client doesn't have an existing account to add to the projection. This just provides the software somewhere to allocate future surpluses if they were to say sell their property or if they have expected surpluses in the future that need to be allocated towards capital assets. In this case, because we have existing accounts for Sonia, I'll delete the default and add those accounts uh, myself. So we have a non-registered account with a current value of 100, 000, or sorry, with a current value of 200,000. That's currently invested as 40% fixed income and 60% equity. You'll see that our rate of return values from the general settings page have been pre-filled into our asset. And the software has calculated an automatic portfolio return based off of our asset allocation. If we wanted, we could customize the rate of return on an account by account basis. So if the equity return in this particular non-reg is expected to be higher than or lower than 5%, we can change that value here. I'll click add capital asset and input a tax-free savings account with a $100,000 value. And then we'll also add in her RSP that has a current value of 500,000. Across the top of our table, we can see that there are additional tabs available for settings related to each of those registered account types. As I click on TFSA, you'll see that I can edit the contribution room assumption in the plan for the first year. This is a very common theme throughout SNAP. 
where you can create a simplified and basic projection using conservative assumptions that have been pre-populated for you, or you can come in and customize these values as needed in order to truly tailor the plan to your client's unique circumstances. In this case, there is no carry forward room for Sonia, so we'll leave the contribution room as just the current year. If I go to RSP and RIF, I'm going to increase her RSP carry forward room to 30,000 based off of her most recent notice of assessment. And I'm also going to add in a pension adjustment related to her defined benefit pension plan. So this will help with tracking RSP room going forward in the projection. You'll also see that each account has a conversion age when it's assumed to change from an RSP to a RIF. And this will help with things like a minimum withdrawal and pension tax credits. So lots of customization available as needed in order to tailor the plan to your, your unique needs. Going back to the table of assets, I'll scroll down and go to the real assets section where we can input her home, which has a current value of 750,000 and an original cost of 400,000. By default, this pre-populates with a inflation rate set to the the or sorry, with an appreciation rate set to the inflation value for the projection. You can customize this if you'd like. We also have the option to purchase a property in a future year. So if the client is saving up for their first home or they want to buy an investment property or a cottage, you can model those transactions here. Similarly, we can sell a property in the future if the client is going to downsize or sell their home and move into assisted living. We can also control whether any of those transactions are going to be taxed for capital gain purposes. I'll click next and go to the debts page. Sonia's already paid off her mortgage and has no outstanding loans, so we can skip this page and go to the government benefits page. You have full control over the CPP and OAS calculations in SNAP. So if you change the start age, that's going to adjust the dollar amount received based off of either the deferral benefit, which we'll see later, or if there's a, a reduction for taking it early, SNAP will calculate that automatically. As a default setting, SNAP assumes that the client is going to receive the national average CPP of 55% of the maximum. If we know how much they're already receiving, we can enter in the dollar amount here. If we have their Service Canada statement showing how much they're estimated to receive, we can enter that here or we can adjust the percentage of maximum based off of an approximation given their employment history and income levels. So in this case, we're going to assume that Sonia will receive 80% of the maximum, and we're going to start with a 65 start age for our first projection. For the old age security, we have similar control over the start age and dollar amount being received, or we can enter in a percentage of maximum, which defaults as 100% of the maximum. And just like that, in about 10 minutes, we've been able to input all of Sonia's base client data into the projection. You'll see on the left that we do have additional pages available in the scenario setup section. We could add insurance policies. We could conduct life needs analysis to see if more life insurance would be recommended. We can add RESPs and corporations, and we can adjust additional settings. But for now, we're going to proceed to the planning pages to see how all of this information can come together to show us Sonia's life on one page. Now this page can seem overwhelming the first time you see it, but once you know what you're looking at, it's incredibly intuitive and a very powerful section of the software. On the left, we have the year and our client's age. Then under the expense section, we have for the period prior to retirement, the calculated discretionary cash flow that's available for spending or other purposes. SNAP is calculating this by taking the client's employment income of 125,000 and then subtracting off the CPP and EI deductions and subtracting off the total tax. And that gives us a sense of how much cash flow is estimated to be available that we can now allocate to savings or other purposes within the plan. We have lots of great information on this page, such as the amount that the client is assumed to be spending throughout retirement. So we have that base spending goal of 66,000 a year being indexed over time for inflation. We have our additional travel budget being indexed. We can see the pension, CPP, and OAS that are starting at age 65. We see key information about taxable income, marginal rates, effective rates. And then we have all of our capital asset information, whether it's the value, whether money's going in or out of the account, and how much it's assumed to be increasing by each year. We can see the home appreciating with inflation, and then we have 
information about the net worth and taxes on the final estate. I'm gonna make two final edits to the plan and then we're ready to start having a discussion with Sonia about her current circumstances and what recommendations we make to optimize her, her particular projection. The first thing is I'm going to click on the contribution value for the TFSA in the first year of the plan. An important note is that any blue or purple value that you see on this page is customizable either on a one-off basis or for any period of the plan. So you can change these values as needed in order to, to customize the plan and align, align it with your client's expectations. So I'll click on the TFSA contribution, enter in a deposit of 6,500. When I do that, you'll see that the run scenario button in the top right corner has turned red. This means that SNAP has received that request to enter in a contribution, but it hasn't yet recalculated the page. Rather than constantly refreshing these numbers and changing them on you every time that you make an update, SNAP waits for you to confirm that you're done making your updates and you wanna recalculate the page to see the new numbers. So now that I've clicked run scenario, it's turned green and we can see that the value of the TFSA has increased to reflect the contribution. Similarly, if I go to the RRSP and enter in a $22,500 contribution, the run scenario will turn red. I can click that, and now the plan is fully up to date. With those additional contributions, we can see that the discretionary cash flow in the first year has been recalculated and is roughly in line with Sonia's estimated spending need of about $66,000 a year. So this process can help us to make sure that the numbers that the client is providing to us all make sense and are appropriate for us to be projecting out into the future. So now we can look in 2024 when the client's set to be retired. We have the spending needs outlined here. We have various incomes available to the client. And then SNAP is automatically taking money out of the capital assets each year in order to top up towards their, their spending need. Once the non-registered account has been depleted, SNAP moves on and starts using the tax-free savings. And then once the RIF is converted at age 72, we can see that the minimum annual withdrawal is being taken out there. And that process continues all the way down until age 94 in 2053, when the client is expected to run out of money. If I come to the very left, I can see the total shortfall that the client is expected to have for the year. So they're short by about 48,000 of spending. And the software tracks that shortfall each year until the end of the plan. So there's a total shortfall of about $400,000. Now we can compare that against the home to give a sense of just how far on or off track they might be if they wanted to consider using home equity as a way to fill this shortfall gap. So roughly a quarter of their home value would need to be used as part of their, their spending, or in this case would need to be either downsized or reverse mortgage or a home equity line of credit. We can also review the plan by using the charts available in SNAP. So the first one is the cash outflows. So this shows the base spending goal, that's the 66,000 a year being indexed over time for inflation. We also have the additional travel goal that's been itemized and, and is currently being fully funded. We can see the income taxes payable each year, the capital asset contribution for the first year while she's still working. And then we can see the total inflows that are available for spending each year. And you'll see that the total inflows are equal to the outflows for the first three decades of the plan. And then as of age 94, we can see the inflows drops to roughly half of her need. So that's where she would have an issue and need to start dipping into home equity or making some other change to her spending habits. Going to the cash inflows, we can see where the money is expected to come from each year of the plan. There's one more year of employment income, and then the remainder of her money comes from a combination of government and employer pensions and withdrawals out of the various capital assets. And we again can see the gap here for the final few years where there's no longer any capital assets to use. And one final view is the net worth where we can see the account values each year. And we can see again, the capital assets at this point have been depleted and she starts effectively borrowing in the plan in order to continue spending at her target rate. And all of these charts are fully customizable. So if I exclude certain values, I can change the view and have different conversations with the client. So this is a, a net liquid uh, assets and, and how much would be available each year across the various sources.
So that's our base projection now completed for Sonia, and we're ready to start moving on to her series of questions so that we can make sure that she's confident moving into retirement. So I'm gonna update the title of this scenario. We'll call it scenario one, base projection with shortfall at age 65, or sorry, at age 94. So we have our, our first plan ready and we can go to Sonia's list of questions. So her first question is, when should she start taking CPP or QPP and OAS? So I'll come back to this projection, copy this scenario so that I have my base projection available for future reference. And then we'll update the title of this new copied version and we'll call this scenario two, defer CPP and OAS. So right now we have CPP and OAS both starting at age 65 in the plan. We can change that by going to scenario setup and government benefits. We can change either each of them individually and then compare scenarios, or we can change them at the both, both at the same time. Um, before we do, just wanna revisit uh, the, the research that Alex mentioned early in our, in our presentation. So this is a great research paper that provides both the quantitative considerations around what the dollar amount uh, differences are between different options, and it also provides some great qualitative resources and behavioral considerations for your clients in terms of how to present this trade-off discussion in order to help th make them help them to make a, an informed decision. So, great research paper when it comes to decisions around QPP and CPP timing. So, I'll start CPP at age 70 you'll see that SNAP automatically adjusts the deferral benefit and increases the dollar amount that they're going to receive. I can then go back to the planning pages and now we'll see that there's no CPP for the first five years and the amount has increased from that point forward in the plan. SNAP is automatically now taking more money out of the non-registered for that period where there's no CPP. And then we can see later that it has to take less money out of the TFSA in these years because it now has more income at that point of the projection. As we continue down to the bottom of the plan, what we want to focus on is whether this has extended the life of Sonia's assets. So previously we had a shortfall at age 94 and we had a total shortfall of 400,000. By deferring CPP to age 70, we now don't run out of money until 96 and our shortfall is only 200,000. So a fairly significant improvement to the financial projection based off of that deferral. And coming back to Alex's earlier comments, we're focused on the longevity because of Sonia's specific goals. So as a single individual with no specific estate considerations, she's really focused on minimizing the chance that she runs out of money before she passes away. And so this strategy of deferring CBP is particularly appropriate for her unique circumstances. If we had a client that was potentially had life considerations and, and a shorter life expectancy, and they were focused on leaving a very specific estate after tax value, what we can do in that case is we can come to the estate before tax section of the software, and we could go to the age that they're considering uh, that they might pass away. So here we could look at age 80. And if we look as of that year, they're expected to have about 1.6 million in total assets and owe about 250,000 in taxes. So they would have an after-tax estate at age 80 of 1.4 million. If we compare that to the scenario where they take the CPP right at 65, we can see that they would have about $60,000 more by taking CPP early than taking it at 70. So it, it all comes back to your client's specific goals, financial circumstances, and SNAP can provide the, the values that you need to not only make a recommendation, but to also help your client understand the pros and cons of each decision that they're making. So now that we've seen that CPP is advantageous for Sonia and her goal, we can do the same steps for the OAS benefit. So we'll go back to the government benefits. We'll change the start age to 70, and then we'll go back to planning pages. Once again, we can see that the value for the first five years is zero. We can see that SNAP is taking even more money now out of the non-registered and TFSA for that period. And then there's a bit of surplus cash flow once all of the government benefits start being received at age 70 onwards. As we continue to the bottom, we can see that we're now running out of money at age 97 instead of 96, and our total shortfall is 158,000. So again, we've been able to prolong her, her assets in order to uh, minimize the chance that she runs out early. 
We can look at other key information in the plan to see whether there might be concerns with this strategy. We can see here there is a bit of OAS clawback for a few years once the RIF minimum starts being received. And we can see that there's now a, a, a smaller marginal tax rate for the five years prior to starting government benefits. So those are things to be aware of and potential opportunities within the projection as we move forward. But overall, with the longevity being improved, uh, we're gonna move forward and recommend deferring both government benefits for Sonia. So we can come back to her list of questions, have a conversation about the pros and cons, show her any of the numbers that she needs to be comfortable, and then move on to her next question, which is about determining the best withdrawal strategy from the different accounts in retirement. So I'll come back to the plan and copy that scenario so that we now have a, a new scenario where we'll build on top of our recommendations so far. And we'll call this alternate uh, decumulation strategy or drawdown strategy, sorry. And once again, when we're having conversations about drawdowns and using capital assets, uh, the research by Doug Chandler refers to the pros and cons of different strategies, when you might use one over the other, what client circumstances to consider in your calculations, and SNAP can help with all of those illustrations and calculations automatically. So we can look at the pros and cons at different ages, so we can compare our estate before tax either at age 70, 75, or at 100 at the very end of the plan, and we can help to make a more informed decision about the different strategies and which one would be ideal for our client. By default, SNAP uses a tax deferral strategy, which was referenced in the research, um, which basically defers all RIF withdrawals as long as possible in order to use up the non-registered money in the projection, which has a tax drag on the returns each year of the plan. The research showed that if your client is expected to pass away shortly after making a RIF withdrawal, they're likely advantaged to take that withdrawal because they'll get it out at a lower marginal rate, and then they'll ultimately be taxed less when they pass away. But if you don't know when your client's gonna pass away, each year that that money sits outside of the RIF in a non-registered, the tax drag on the rate of return is going to gradually offset any benefits of taking it out early. So once again, we wanna come back to the client's goal. Are they focused on longevity or estate after tax? And what other account balances do they have available? Uh, that's all going to drive which option to recommend. So in this case, we can turn on the cash flow management order for the projection in order to try a different strategy. Um, so in this case, we're using non-registered, then tax-free, and then RIF as the last source once we've run out of all other money. We could change that to a different strategy. We could do something like registered first and then non-registered and then TFSA in order to draw down all of our taxable income as soon as possible in the projection. So now we can see that SNAP is using up the registered money first, then it's using up the non-reg, and then the TFSA at the end. And what's happened is that by making that change to the drawdown strategy, we've now brought our shortfall back to age 96, and we've increased our total shortfall by about $70,000. So for her longevity goal, this strategy is less uh, advantaged than the one that we had previously. However, if they were concerned about after tax estate values, if we come to age 75, for instance, shortly after they've used up all of their registered money, we can see that in this case, they would have about 1.39 million available to pass on to their heirs. Whereas if they had used the registered money later, they would have 1.38. So again, it shows those pros and cons of, of each strategy and which one might be advantageous for your client's circumstances. Rather than doing kind of an all or none strategy where we use up all of the registered first, another option is that we could go back to our default of non-registered, tax-free, and then registered. And then we can override certain accounts in order to more optimally draw down given what we know about our client's circumstances. So here we have a five-year period where our marginal rate is slightly lower. And we can see that we're going to be using up the non-registered money in the plan very shortly anyways. So there might be an advantage to taking some money out of the RIF early in the plan. So for the first five years of retirement, 
I'm just going to take $30,000 in order to take advantage of that lower marginal tax rate. Similarly, I can enter in contributions to the tax-free savings in order to move money into that account uh, on a more tax advantage basis. So I can now combine the automation of SNAP with my control and transparency of being able to customize the projection exactly how I'd like it. So now we have contributions to the TFSA, we have some withdrawals from the RSP. We can see that our marginal rate is now a bit smoother and we've gotten rid of the OAS clawback in the plan. And as we come all the way to the bottom, we can see that our shortfall is now 145,000 instead of 152,000. So these more granular changes are having some slight advantage, but nothing um, you know, as material as deferring CPP or as using a more optimal drawdown like deferring RSPs as long as possible. So now that we've been able to compare a few different strategies, show the pros and cons of the different approaches, we're ready to make our recommendation, which is to use a bit of registered money over the next five years until the government benefits start, continue topping up the TFSA until the non-registered money runs out, and then draw down a blend between the RIF and the TFSA for the remainder of the plan. Coming back to Sonia's list of questions, her next one is about whether or how to use home equity in the plan in order to fill any shortfall. So here we still have four years of shortfall even after our various optimizations that we've made. So I'll go to the top, I'll copy this scenario, and we'll do a fourth scenario that includes a home downsizing. Right now in the plan, we have the home increasing in value at the rate of inflation all the way to the end of the projection. But what we could choose to do is to sell it in a future year, uh, potentially at age 75, for instance, and take some of the proceeds, invest that into our capital assets, and use the remainder to purchase a replacement home. So I'll go to assets, go down to our real assets section. I'll input a future sale age of 75, and then I'll add a new home with a purchase price of 700,000 and a future purchase age of 75. So we're gonna sell her existing home, purchase a new one, and then invest the difference in that year of the plan. So now coming to the real assets section, we have the home until age 75. We replace it with a $700,000 value, and we can see that the, the difference uh, is used for spending and to top up the TFSA and non-registered accounts. If I wanted, I could then gradually move this non-registered money into the TFSA. So I could enter in uh, a $20,000 contribution. And one great thing about SNAP is that it has guardrails in place. So when I enter 20,000, SNAP is going to check each year of the plan, how much contribution room is available based off of its calculations. And it will replace my contribution request with the actual maximum that's expected in that year. So we can see the gradual increase over time in those $500 increments. So now we've topped up the TFSA, we get to the bottom of the plan, and we have about 450,000 left over as buffer. So this is one way that she could choose to use home equity in order to avoid the shortfall that we've been illustrating so far. And coming back to her final question, so now she's wondering if she does plan to use some home equity how much is the maximum that she could spend given all of the assumptions that we've input in the plan so far? So we'll come back to the projection, copy it one final time. And we'll call this scenario five, maximum spending. So right now we're spending 66,000 a year indexed for inflation over time automatically. We have a tool in SNAP called the Recommendations Module that allows you to have SNAP calculate various values in order to accelerate your planning process. So in this case, we want to know how much extra could we spend each year in order to use up this surplus that we're currently projecting of 462000 in capital assets at the end of the plan. So if we click Calculate, we could spend 70000 as the upper limit on our uh, budget each year. So this gives your client a bit of comfort around how much flexibility is there in the plan if we needed to adjust spending over time um, based off of her, her ongoing needs. 
So those are the, the five projections that we wanted to create today in order to create a base scenario and address Sonia's four key questions. Uh, we have had to move fairly quickly throughout the software just to demonstrate the, the capabilities. Uh, when you're done and you're ready to present any of these to your client, you can either use the software itself as we have today, or you can generate a client report by going to the client report section, selecting which pages you'd like to include, you can review the report preview that has your customizable logo, your selected background, and then all of the, the pages that you've selected for client presentation. You can generate the PDF and share that with them either in person or by email. Uh, the moment that you do sign up for your trial or your free trial with SNAP, you'll have immediate access to the help site, which you can access from the top right of the software going to help center. And from here, you have the ability to view any of our webinar recordings to learn more about the dedicated features. So if you wanna learn more about the automated recommendations tool that calculated the sustainable spending for us, you can go here. You can also check out things like uh, tips and tricks to get the most out of SNAP's new tools. And you can also search for key terms if there's ever a, a transaction that you're looking to model and not certain how to input that in the software. And then of course, if you ever get stuck, you can give us a call or send us an email and we're available for one-on-one -on -one support by phone, email, and screen sharing. Um, and with that, I'm gonna pass it back to Alex and we're gonna go through a few next steps and then open it up for questions. Wonderful, Steve. Thank you so much. That was incredible to watch you address those questions so efficiently. Um, We've had a ton of questions come in throughout the session, so thank you so much to everyone uh, for all of your engagement and participation. Um, and as Steve just said, we know that was a lot to absorb in a short period of time, but I hope we've been able to show the value that SNAP can bring to your practice and to your clients' lives. During this hour, we've explored crucial research and modeled four essential financial planning questions. I hope everyone has learned some actionable strategies that will help their practice. Now, if you're ready to take action and you'd like to give, uh, give SNAP a try for yourself and get in there and see if you can model some of these questions for your own clients, on our pricing page, you'll see there are two plans for you to choose from as an independent advisor. You can get set up with a 14-day free trial. Our main module, Advisor Business, includes a comprehensive feature for corporate planning, as well as data sharing for teams. So if anyone wants to see the corporate module in the Q&A, uh, just let us know and we should be able to pull that up for you. I'm going to send the link um, in the chat now that will take you to this page. So you can open up your chat just by clicking the arrow beside the word chat. Uh, and you can see that there. I'd go ahead and click on that link now so you have the window open up on your device before the session closes out. And I will send this to you via email as well uh, once the session is over. And a final note on the eligible CE credit for this session. All advisors who attended the full session today will receive an email in one hour that will include a video replay as well as a link to a short survey. The survey must be filled out with your full name and email address so we can accurately complete and send out your certificate. Uh, you will have these by uh, December 15th at the absolute latest. All right, so we are now going to move in to the Q&A. So we've had a lot of questions uh, come in here, so I don't know that we'll have time to get through all of them. Um, but let's start with uh, a few questions, Steve, around taxes on a state. Um, so can we see sort of the breakdown on the... Uh, yeah, the, the summaries that we have there and maybe as well as the, the general tax um, forms as well, just to show everybody those. Perfect, yeah, we can definitely go over the, the tax resources. So the first thing that you'll have available each year of the plan is the taxable income figure. So first year it's 107,000 and then the next year in retirement it's 55. 
we have a taxable income details table that breaks that out uh, across the various categories. So in this case, we have employment income of 125,000. We have some customizable assumptions about the non-registered portfolio and what types of investment income that's generating. And then we have a deduction related to the registered uh, contribution to the RSP. Then later we have pension incomes, continued non-registered investment income, and then eventually we have RIF withdrawals. So those are the types of resources that we have on an ongoing annual basis within the plan. We can also see for the total tax, whether that's federal, provincial, um, and we have lots of settings available within the scenario setup settings income taxes section to add credits, deductions, taxable income, uh, or taxable benefits rather, and customize any of the, the settings in the plan. So always happy to, to go in more detail if you have specific questions about changing any of the, the calculations. When it comes to the estate, we can see here the estate before tax for each year of the plan, and then the calculated tax on estate. If we click on the estate before tax value in a year, so let's say at age 70, for instance, SNAP will break out the, the details for this particular plan, and then as we saw, we can compare it with any of the other projections that we've done. Here we have the capital assets, real assets, net worth, and then taxes on estate. Now, currently this value is bundled together. We often get questions about whether we can break this out across different sources. The main challenge with doing that is that then you would have to have a hierarchy of what assets are being considered the first taxable source. So really, when you look at a, a client's income for the year or at an estate, there's total taxable income across all of the different sources, and then there's the total taxes payable. Now we can get a sense of where these taxes are being attributed based off of information in the plan. So for instance, we can see the, the cost basis of a non-registered account each year in the plan by going to the account value and learning more about that, that information. We can also, of course, see the RSP value, which would tell us how much is being considered taxable income in that year. So we do have information available throughout the software, but for the most part, the, the tax on a state and tax payable in a year is really associated with all income received in that year or in the estate. Perfect, thank you, Steve. All right, um, we've had a few questions come in around government benefits. Um, so can you give us a review of um, how it works, uh, what the options are, what you did for this scenario, and also just explain um, what the assumptions are. Um, you know, for example, if somebody is withdrawing uh, early, is the software accounting uh, for the fact that they have stopped, you know, contributing early, those types of things? Yeah, great questions. So if we go to government benefits, by default, SNAP will provide the client with 55% of the maximum starting at age 65. And that's purely based off of the national average being received. I, I really wish that we had all of the data that we need on your clients in order to estimate their, their CPP that they'll receive, but there's just such a long employment history prior to when the, the projection begins that we can't make that calculation automatically. And so we conservatively assume that they will receive the national average of 55%. If you know what your client is currently receiving, you can enter that dollar value here. So if they're currently earning 14,000 from CPP, you can input the dollar amount, or you can approximate how much they'll receive based off of their employment history. So you know, there's the 47 year eligible period, they'll have some dropout years, they might have some uh, child rearing years. So it, it would depend on your client's unique circumstances, how many of those years they've been above the YMPE. But based off of all of that information, you should be able to fairly accurately approximate how much they'll receive um, once they do retire. So if they're retiring at 50 and they're not taking CBP until 65, you know that they can't receive the maximum because they'll have such a long period being dropped out of their calculation. Um, so if you ever have questions, uh, we do have a, a tool that the Government of Canada provides that can help you estimate the, the CPP benefit. Um, and if you have more questions about how that calculation works, I'm, I'm happy to share resources uh, to get started. But ultimately, we make um, base assumptions for CPP, it's the national average. For OAS, it's 100%. And then you have full control to either set the dollar amount 
or the percentage of maximum. And then you can also change the start age that you want any of those benefits being received. Perfect, thank you. Um, so a question about the charts. Um, can you take us through uh, the combined uh, inflows and outflows charts just to show uh, a little bit slower uh, everything that is in there and how you would uh, explain that to a client? Yeah, so um, with the cash outflows chart, um, it's, it's always tricky to know which one comes first, inflows or outflows. Um, primarily in retirement, you have a defined spending goal. In this case, we have our base expense need, which is $66,000 a year, and then we're increasing that over time for inflation. So this shows the client, here's what you're gonna need each year for things like groceries, transportation, property taxes, gifts to, to family members and friends. On top of that base spending need, related to your lifestyle, we also have other items. We have your additional travel budget for the first decade of retirement, which is increasing your spending need for that first period. We have income taxes payable because your 66,000 a year is net of taxes, net of debt, net of other contributions to capital assets. And then we have potentially contributions to, to investment accounts. So based off of the plan and how you set it up, if you had insurance premiums or other expenses, if you had more additional expenses than just the travel one, all of those would be itemized here so that you can have a conversation about the expenses over time. Then in order to fund each of those goals, that's where we can come to the cash inflow section and we show where the money is coming from. So in the first year, you have 125,000 of employment income and that equals exactly the 125,000 of outflows that we've calculated in the first year. So 125,000 comes in, and it gets split across these three categories, contributions, tax, and spending. Then in retirement, we can see the sources that you have available, whether it's pensions, OAS, CPP, or withdrawals out of capital assets. And again, at the end, we can see there's a bit of a shortfall, which is what causes our inflows to drop below our spending need in the last six years of the plan. And then layered on top of the inflows and outflows are the net result. So are we, is our net worth increasing each year? Is it decreasing? If we take away the, the home, um, you know, what does it look like then? Here we can see just a fairly steady decline because in this case, the client is one year away from retirement. If they were 20 years before retirement, you'd see the gradual increase and then eventual use of those capital assets within the plan. Um, so those are the, the charts in a bit more detail and you can include any of these charts on a customized basis. So if I wanted to show this view, I can include that in the client report uh, in order to have my conversations with the client. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, and the last question um, that I think we're gonna have time here uh, time for here today. Can you just show us how the uh, blended rates of return uh, came to be? Yeah, so if we go back to our assets page, we have the rate of return for each asset category. So our cash return assumption is 1%, fixed income is two, equity is five. When we say that 60% of our portfolio is gonna receive 5%, 40% is gonna receive two. That's gonna give us our total expected blended portfolio return of 3.8%. If I were to change this to 70% and this to 30, now I can see that my total return is 4.1. And if I had 100% equity, this is gonna be 5%. And then as I mentioned before, you can also change the rate of return for any of the uh, asset classes based off of a, an account by account basis. So here I've not only set my equity allocation to 100%, I've also increased the return to six and therefore my portfolio return is six. So all of these values are customizable. And another great thing is that you can change those in future years as well. So right now, let's say that the client is, is invested fairly aggressively, they're, they're still young, but when they get close to retirement, they wanna change their asset allocation. You can click on the rate of return in any year of the plan and change either the asset allocation or the return assumption. Maybe they're gonna have less aggressive equity allocation. And so we're gonna to go to 30, 70 with a back to our two and 5% return assumptions. 
And now you can see that I have different rates for each year of the plan. And I can do this as many times as I'd like in order to de-risk the portfolio over time. Um, so lots of customizable options. Uh, and then, as I mentioned before, you can also control how these rates are split across taxable sources, whether it's dividend income, interest, capital gains, and so forth. So um, you can get started with a quick and simple plan, or you can conduct more comprehensive plans by customizing values as needed. Perfect. Thank you so much. So we are at the hour, so I do want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, Again, all the questions still remaining, we will follow up with you via email. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for being here live with us today. And I hope this has been a valuable session for all of you. Uh, everybody here, uh, please watch for that email uh, in one hour with the video replay that will have your form to fill out. Let me know if you have any issues uh, getting that form filled out and we can give you a hand. Enjoy the rest of your day and I'm looking forward to continuing the conversation offline. Bye for now.